On this episode of This Week in Linux, we talk about Fedora removing 32-bit, well, sort of. System76 announced two laptops that are using the Core Boot firmware. There is some interesting news regarding Docker and its future. And then we'll check out some Linux gaming news with some really exciting news from Valve. And have you ever wanted to use Elgato's Stream Deck device on Linux? Well, thanks to a couple open source projects, that's now possible. In other app news, Caliber 4.0 and Flatpak 1.5 were released. And speaking of Flatpak, there's a new universal desktop app store featuring Flatpaks, snaps, and app images called the App Outlet. We'll take a look at that on this episode, as well as a new image compressor tool called M Compressor. Then we'll round out the show with a new device that Microsoft announced to compete in the foldable phone space. And we'll talk about that as well as the other foldable phones. And all that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized by managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. We love the DigitalOcean because they provide so many great options to, to utilize their servers for. Like, for example, they have their own marketplace where you can actually install apps really easily, very easily, in fact. And they also have 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. You can get all of this plus access to world class customer support for as low as $5 per month. And you can get started on DigitalOcean for free with a one month $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. That's do.co slash tux. And you can get $50 credit for free for one month by going to do.co slash tux. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux. A first in the show this week, Fedora has announced they're going to be removing 32-bit from their support cycle. Now, we don't have to worry about getting pitchforks in this case because it's not remotely as like the same way that other distros in you know Ubuntu had uh, wanted to do. Uh, Ubuntu wanted to do something that was a little too much, whereas Fedora is doing a more reasonable approach. So there was a lot. There was some people talking about how on uh, Twitter, for example, there were some people saying that, you know, why aren't people getting up in arms about Fedora removing 32-bit when they were so mad at Canonical and Ubuntu for doing it? And the reason is because they're doing it in a very, very different way. They say that uh, Fedora is going to be removing the 32-bit ISO support for through the um, like at the end of the Fedora 30. So for, 30, for Fedora 31 and beyond are going to be dropping 32-bit. So for example, right now you have 32 you have 32-bit available for Fedora 30, and they're going to have support for that until the, like the throughout its life cycle. So roughly the end of May or June is when of 2020 is when they're going to be dropping 32-bit support entirely. But they're they're top, they're not top dropping it entirely. They're dro- dropping 32-bit support for the ISOs entirely. So they're not going to be pushing out uh, Fedora 32-bit versions anymore. They will be keeping the 32-bit packages and libraries using the i686 packaging uh, that they have done through, uh, you know, stuff like uh, ma- it makes it possible to keep multilib, wine, steam, and all those things still working. So the reason why there's no up in arms against Fedora for doing this is ba- mainly because they're not doing the thing that Canonical and Ubuntu announced. Because Ubuntu announced dropping 32-bit completely, including libraries that broke Multilib, Wine, and Steam. So that's why people got you know up in arms, and they're not going to be dropping all 32-bit support, so that's great. If you'd like to learn more about this particular topic, I'll have a link to the Fedora Magazine sh- uh, post on in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we got some great news from System76. They have announced that they're going to be releasing two laptops that are being powered by the Core Boot firmware to be an open source firmware based laptops, which is fantastic. And these two, they've actually already announced the Darter Pro previously to be able to do it. Now the Galago Pro is also going to be possible to do it. And they're going to be la- announcing the full, uh, you know, available to everyone. Uh, but it's not currently available right now in the terms of. You know, being able to order it right now, you can pre-order. You can pre-order, and then it'll wait a little while, just a couple weeks or so, because they say that they'll be shipping in the last week of October. 
so it's not that much of a wait, but it is a couple week wait. It, the price for the Galago Pro will be $949, the Darter Pro will be $999, and the and System76 is quoted to say, our lightweight op open source firmware gets users from boot screen to desktop 29% faster. And they're also removing unnecessary features from the firmware, such as network connectivity and ex execution environments also decreases the potential for vulnerability, meaning users who upgrade to the new laptops will benefit from the increased security. Now, these laptops are also going to be having uh, matte uh, 180, 1080p IPS displays. Intel's recently launched 10th gen uh, generation I Intel Core i ser series, like the i5 and the i7, specifically the i5. Uh, 10210U and the i7-10510U. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Intel UHD graphics, 60, uh, 620 graphics cards will be included. Uh, this is the onboard graphics. Uh, M.2 SATA SSD storage will be available and up to 6 terabytes depending on which model you get. And they're also going to be having uh, gigabit Ethernet, of course, uh, wireless uh, Wi-Fi through AC, which is great. Uh, 5.0 Bluetooth, US, uh, USB Type-C support with a th Thunderbolt 3 port. That'll be a, a included with the Type-C, so that's pretty cool. They're also going to have like a multi-touch pad, uh, multi-touch touchpad, uh, SD card reader, and many other things. So there's a lot of stuff coming into it, and one of the things that I really like about it is that they will also come with the Intel management engine disabled by default for extra security. So that's great. Uh, System76 have also provided the source code for the core boot open source firmware that they're including in the Darter Pro and the, Ga the Galago Pro on their GitHub account. So if you want to check out the repos for both the Darter Pro and the Galago Pro's way they're doing core boot, I'll have a link to the GitHub page for the source code in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some interesting news about Docker. ZDNet released an article saying that Docker's in deep trouble, and there's also some other websites saying that, no, it's not. It's you know, People are blowing out of proportion. Now, I don't know for sure, obviously, but it's an interesting topic because Docker is one of the, is like the founder of the content of, of like containerization process in the industry and has like kind of revolutionized stuff. But at the same time, they've done some unfortunate mistakes over the years and are currently not still not making a profit. And that's kind of where the deep trouble thing is coming in, as well as the a memo that was released, well, leaked, basically, uh, by someone at Docker. And they've basically saying that they're trying to clarify things to the employees of Docker, and, they, and they're basically saying that you know they have financial issues, but they're not saying it exactly like that. So here's a quote from the memo. We have been engaging with investors to secure more financing to continue to execute on our strategy. I wanted to share a quick update on where we stand. We are currently in active negotiations with two investors and are working through final terms. We should be able to provide you a more complete update within the next couple of weeks. So the weird thing is that Docker has been around for six years now, and they're not making a profit yet. So the investors, like the venture capitalists that they have, which they do have some big ones like Goldman Sachs, Greylock Partners, ME, Cloud Ventures, and more. So like they have financing through these uh, investors and these venture capitalists but you know these people are going to only wait for so long right uh, because it's been six years and what's interesting is that they've been this is the current the current ceo is their fourth ceo that they've had in six years that's that's a lot of turnover for a ceo to be the previous ceo steve singh promised in may of 2019 that docker would be cash flow positive by the end of this fiscal year but it doesn't seem to be doing that and it also seems like they don't really have a viable business plan. You know, what's another thing that's interesting is that there's talks about why this happened in these articles. And one of the things that was said is that this is in part because Docker had hoped that making that their containerization, their container organiz, organ, orchestration software called Docker Swarm would be like the profit center. Then Kubernetes came along. And Kubernetes is basically taken over completely in that field. So Docker's, you know, put bet into it and it didn't work out. So if you're not aware, Kubernetes is an or a container or orchestration software created by Google. Now, Google doesn't technically control it anymore. They actually gave it to a foundation that was part in part them founding it or they're at least a part of it. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they technically were creators of the foundation, but they are definitely a part of the foundation. And it's called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And it includes Google, Red Hat, Twitter, Intel, Cisco, IBM, Huawei, Mesosphere, VMware, and more, including Docker. Because Docker is now using, or they have been for a little while, using uh, Kubernetes for their orchestration. So it's it's kind of interesting. And there's also a lot of different you know people talking back and forth about whether they're in deep trouble or whether they're not, and whether it's just overblown and that kind of thing. And one of the things that people were saying was, uh, one of the reasons why Docker Swarm never took off is because Docker required root access to you know uh, to orchestrate and facilitate most of the stuff it needed to do, and that's why Red Hat had actually decided to not do Docker at all. They used Podman and Builda to instead, and that's kind of that's pretty interesting because it was more like not even just the orchestration stuff; it was just Docker in general was doing that. So like it's kind of interesting because Docker keeps you know they. They, they were the first to get to the space, to even kind of create the space, but they, you know, making a few mistakes along the way. A technologist on Twitter, Matt Assay, I think, says, there's a side of me that wonders why no one seems to be weeping for Docker, which did so much to launch the container revolution, but has profited relatively little therefrom. Technologist Ben Keeps, Kep, Kepace, I don't know, sorry. Uh, tweeted in a reply to that, Docker was a victim of its own arrogance and hubris. They thought they could create a walled garden off the back of an open source project and failed to see that there was no obvious way to scale revenue from their model. Now that's interesting because there have been people talking about how Docker wasn't really open source in the philosophical way, that they were they were taking the opportunity of having open source project to benefit themselves rather than benefiting everyone, which is kind of the purpose. Whereas Kubernetes is an open source project started by Google, but is completely open, and that's why it took off. So it's an interesting perspective because it kind of says that Docker kind of did it to themselves because they could have done it if they were to have done it the right way. I don't know. I'm just curious what you think if you use Docker. Like I still use Docker in some cases. Uh, the discourse forum for Destination Linux does use Docker, and there's a lot of stuff that use it as well. So if you use Docker and you are you know, interested in this topic, please let me know, and let me know what your opinion is in the comments below or on the disc discourse destinationlinux.network forum. And you can, you know, I'll have a, there'll be a post of this episode on the forum. So if you'd like to comment there, you can do so as well. So yeah, please let me know what you think about this particular topic and uh, let's move on. Up next in the show is some really interesting news from Valve. Now, if you're not a gamer, this is a gaming topic. Be sure not to skip the entire show because there's still quite a few more topics. So anyway, but if you are a gamer, Actually, even if you're not, this technology is really interesting what they're doing. So you might be interested there too. But if you are a gamer, this is really, really cool. There's potential to change a lot of way, like a lot of games availability and interest based solely on this feature. So Valve is introducing or will be introducing something called Remote Play Together. Now, they've said that this is coming during the week of October 21st. We don't know exactly when in that week. But that's what they're saying. And this is actually a leak of information because we don't really, it hasn't been announced yet, but they Valve sent word to some game developers and it didn't take very long for the game developers to leak it apparently. So here's what they're saying in the, in like this, this is like a quote from the email that was sent to game developers. And I'll have a link to the uh, tweet that shows the, this information, this, the memo or this email uh, in a, like an image form. So they say, we're, reach we're reaching out to let you know about a new feature heading to Steam. Your local multiplayer games will soon be improved with autom automatic support for remote play together on Steam. This is awesome. So it says, remote play together is a new Steam feature that enables two or more players to enjoy local multiplayer games over the internet. We think this, will f this feature will be very valuable for customers and developers and are excited about the beta. We've provided an, a frequently asked questions at the bottom of this message, which we we think addresses most questions and concerns. All local multiplayer, uh, local co-op, and split-screen games will be automatically included in the remote play together beta, which we plan to launch the week of October 21st. 
So this is awesome. So this makes it possible for you to play with friends in a co-op style or a local multi multiplayer style over the internet. Because there are some games that have local co-op and local multiplayer, but for some reason don't have online of either one of those. This makes it possible to actually still play them online with friends remotely, wherever they are, and just kind of bypass the restriction that the game had. So that is awesome. Because there's actually a few games that I would want to play with people that it's like a co-op mode, but for some reason was local co-op only, and that's just ridiculous. I get it why they do it. It's because it's a lot easier to do local co-op than it is to do online co-op. But this changes a ton for everything. And I'm trying to avoid the game changer um, pun, but it really is a game changer because of how much it can be, you know, change the way that people look at get certain games that they might want to buy. Because the local co-op versus online co-op would no longer be a problem depending on the type of game. And that is awesome. So, I look forward to that for sure. Now there are other there are other services that make it possible to do local multiplayer titles, uh, like Parsec, for example. But they they've had some they've had their own issues and they're not built into Steam and you know they have to have support for different platforms and all that stuff, which I don't think I'm not sure if it has support for Linux or not, but or Parsec I mean, but that being built into Steam makes it possible to have. Uh, pl cross platform between Windows and uh, PC and uh, Linux users on your PC, so you can have uh, you can play multi games, multiplayer games in a local co op style. Regardless, essentially is basically what they're saying. Now, we don't know for sure if this is coming to Linux, but knowing Valve, it probably is because Valve does have a lot of interest in Linux. They created Pro or helped create Proton. They've brought a lot of games to Linux. They've actually made it possible for the Linux gaming ecosystem to really exist and thrive, which it has. So I'd be shocked if they didn't have support for it. Uh, they haven't confirmed that yet, but I would be shocked. Anyway, so this was this when this was released, there was actually a reply from Twitter from one of the developers of Valve says that they want to clarify something. It really is only for shared screen or split screen games the tech is streaming your screen to your friend and capturing their input and sending it back to the game so you're both playing the same game basically looking at the same thing that's this is really interesting because it adds another factor to it it means that only one person needs to own the game and then you can invite others to join you so you like most online co-ops you both need to own the game in this way you only only one of you need to own the game and then you could have stream the inputs data back and forth this is really interesting. I can't wait to try on in a bunch of games. So, um, yeah, as soon as this comes out, I'm going to be trying it out. It's going to be in a beta when it, as soon as it releases. So keep that in mind if you don't want to use betas. Uh, we don't know exactly how long it's going to take to get the out of beta. But if you are interested, I'll have a link to the Gaming on Linux article about this as well as the tweets from the developers who were essentially leaking this information. So, yeah, links in the show notes. Up next in the show is another gaming piece of news, and that is updates and issues for the Atari VCS. Now, this is an interesting situation because, well, they announced something that was cool, and then a week later, we got some bad news. Although, not from Atari themselves, or the people making the Atari VCS, but rather a company, a, a company and guy who was a part of making the Atari VCS. So, first of all, Atari announced that they have a partnership with the AntStream Arcade service to bring a ton of classic games to the Atari VCS. So if you're not aware, Ant, uh, AntStream Arcade is a game streaming service that hosts like a lot of licensed retro games for various platforms and they're able to stream it to your machine. So you can play games from like the Amiga, Spectrum, Commodore 64, um, the old Atari systems, Sega Mega Drive, and more and more and so on. And it has dedicated application you can stream the games through, but it comes at a cost, you know, with a subscription. So they they said they're going to have support for that for those when if when it whenever it comes out if it comes out. Now the negative issue is that Rob Wyatt, who Atari made a big thing over him joining the the project, because he's a industry veteran for gaming, and he's one of the founding team members behind the Xbox. In fact and is the was 
the Atari system architect. He has announced that he is quitting, and he, his citing for why is non-payment of invoices for at least six months. So Atari hasn't been paying the architect who's building the Atari VCS. So that doesn't sound very good. And then also Atari also put out their own update post on the same day. We don't know for exactly if they're doing it trying to bury the news, but it's odd that it's the same day. And it doesn't actually give us anything new about the hardware. It's just like, you know, reiteration, buzzword stuff. That That's pretty much what it was. And they also claim that they'll be able to show their own UI and st store frameworks and apps and more on a VCS unit to a select group of press and partners later this fall. Whatever that exactly means, who that means, we don't know. Um, they also said that they're still looking to do a retail launch of spring 2020. I want this to be true. You know, I want the Atari VCS to become a thing because it's a Linux-based console. That's really cool. Because it's hard, it's AMD based. That's also cool. It looks really nice. It looks like an old retro style Atari, and I think that's a really cool concept to have newer hardware in a retro style layout. And I think that it has a lot of potential to be a good piece of hardware. And I also want the people who backed it to you know get something for what they put in to back it, because we but we've talked about this before, and you know. I've shown I've been excited about it in many cases, especially like the controller. The controller looks really nice. There was an actual like situation where they went to a conference that they were supposedly going to be demonstrating stuff, but really they just had empty boxes. So, I don't know. I want this to be successful. I want the Atari VCS to happen. I want it to be successful. I want it to have good hardware. I want it to have a good everything. But at the moment, I'm not holding my breath about it. But this is not good news for the architect of the system to no longer be the architect of the system. So best of luck to Atari, and uh, please make something good. Please come, to f come through with your uh, crowdfunding, because you did crowdfund it. Yeah, let's move on to the next topic. Before we continue, I'd like to take a brief moment to do a little bit of housekeeping segment. Uh, if you haven't heard, there's actually an audio feed, so if you want to listen to the podcast version while you're commuting or something like that, you can do so by going to touchdigital.com slash thisweekinlinux, and you'll find an RSS feed there. You can also just use any kind of podcast app and just search for it in the podcast directory on whatever app you use. I'm pretty sure that the show is on all of them. If not, if you do find a platform that the show is not on, please let me know because I would like to fix that immediately. And if you're not aware, there is a segment index. And this is actually a term that I kind of created, but there's like bookmarks and chapters and other things that are also associated to that. But I call it a segment index because, well, that's just the first thing I thought of. Anyway, so the segment index is a way for you to skip around for different topics to see which topics you, you're interested in the most and check that out and then go back and watch the rest of the show because, you know, go back and watch the rest of the show. Please. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, it just makes it easy for you to easily jump around between, like, different topics and you can, like, watch whatever topic you're most interested in immediately and go back and watch later. And if you're on the, if you use the podcast feed, you can also do that in t most podcast apps. Not, not all of them, but most of them have support for the bookmark system that is available in the MP3 as well. So there's that for you. And if you like the show and you appreciate the the content and the effort, the effort put into the show uh, please uh, please consider becoming a patron you can do so by going to tuxdigital.com slash patreon or tuxdigital.com slash sponsors and you could be, become a patron for as low as a dollar a month on patreon or as low as a dollar of three dollars a month on sponsors and you get a lot of rewards in addition in addition to being uh, helping the show be created and help me be able to take the time to spend as much ridiculous amount of time that I do on this show. It's so like, you know, anywhere between 20 to 40 hours on this show to make it every week, as well as the Destination Linux podcast. If, you know, if you're if you're not aware, I do that podcast as well. Uh, and uh, you should check it out if you aren't aware, because it is a great podcast in addition to this podcast. Uh, very different type of podcast, but still both quality podcasts, if I do say so myself. And anyway, if you'd like to contribute to the show, it would be very much appreciated and incredibly appreciated because it, it makes it possible for me to do the show 
And uh, all the patrons who are currently patrons, thank you very much for all the stuff that you're doing with, for me, help making it possible for this show to exist. And uh, yeah, so if you'd like to become a patron, go to tuxedo.com slash Patreon, tuxedo.com slash sponsors to sign up. Also, if you would like to support the show without any cost to you, you can use our affiliate links by going to tuxedo.com slash affiliates. That's where you can find links for Amazon, Private Internet Access, Humble Bundle, and many, many more by going to tuxedo.com slash affiliates. And you can also get the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt. It's a shirt I made to celebrate the proliferation of Linux, and it actually has a design where Tux is blended into the background to convey the message that even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. And you can get this in uh, North America and in Europe shipping. And if you want to, you can go to tuxedo.com slash Linux everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxedo.com slash Linux everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. And as I said, I also do the, the Destination Linux podcast. So if you'd like to check it out, you can go to destinationlinux.org to find out more about the show. And if you like, you can go to destinationlinux.network to find all the different shows and content on the network, as well as the Discourse Forum. You can go to discourse.destinationlinux.network to sign up and be a, become a part of the, the forum. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a awesome it's an awesome forum. Uh, you know, also not biased or anything at all. And if you'd like to uh, become a part of that, you can do so by going to de- discourse.destinationlinux.network. And you can also consider joining the Mumble server, which if you're not aware, Mumble server is kind of like Discord where you have a voice chat. And you know, I'm, I'm on there, you know, most days. So if you'd like to come have a chat with me, feel free to go to mumble.destinationlinux.network. Now let's get back to the show. Up next in the show... Have you ever wanted to use the Stream Deck from El- Elgato? This is a device that allows you to have a set of macros and commands and shortcuts and stuff like that in this device, but it also has it based on these individual buttons. That you hit these buttons, and they will perform whatever task you tell them to perform. Now, the really cool thing about them is that each button is also an LCD screen, so you can change what the image on the button is and you can actually have like a profile set up or whatever that you can switch to what those images are whenever you need to. I'm not I haven't really fully used I haven't tested one of these myself because prior they didn't have support for Linux. They still technically don't have support for Linux, but thanks to a couple open source projects, it is now possible to use the Stream Deck on Linux. Now, first of all, we have a project from the uh, it's called the Python Elgato Stream Deck Library. It's an open source Python 3 library to control an Elgato Stream Deck directly without the official software. And it allows you to, like basically they built it to make it possible for people to make GUIs uh, or applications that utilize this library to manipulate the Stream Deck without having to use the official software, which of course is only Windows. Maybe it's Mac, I don't know. If you want to get a Stream Deck, it does look a pretty cool piece of hardware and, and pretty cool uh, you know, the idea itself is cool. If it does work on Linux, thanks to these projects, I think that's really awesome. Uh, I actually had to, you know, when I, I thought about getting one of those, but because it didn't have support, I went and got this keyboard that's just kind of ridiculous where it has like no labels on the keyboard. If you're listening to the podcast version, I showed the, what the keyboard I use looks like. Uh, and it's just basically like, it's a big, it's a small keyboard, but it has like 48 keys and every key is blank because it's just basic keys, no LCDs, of course, so I, I didn't customize it. And because I use it for different purposes, I don't want to put labels on them because they'll be relevant and sometimes and sometimes wouldn't be. So I just have to remember what they are and what giving pro, what profile I'm currently on. You know, it is a lot. So the idea of this Stream Deck thing is pretty cool, especially because it has all those uh, LCD screens in it. So thankfully, that library was built and... Another thing that was built that's really cool. And that project is the Stream Deck underscore UI project. So this is a GUI based on Qt that allows you to have uh, customizations to, basically just allows you to use the Stream Deck library that was created through Python with that other project and be able to do it in a GUI so you can customize the text of what says it, the image that's displayed, the command that it does, the shortcut that it's outputs because you can actually make it where you hit the button and it just puts out an output what it puts out a shortcut 
So instead of doing a command, which you can do, you can also just tell it to do a shortcut that you've already assigned to another application that you're already on. And like, for example, if you have OBS running, you can assign shortcuts to basically anything in OBS. And then you could have one of those buttons activate that particular shortcut that you assigned to the OBS scene or whatever. So that is a really, really cool uh, concept. And I'm, I, I kind of wish now that I had a Stream Deck so I could test this out. Uh, but this is really cool. And this has a support for a lot of cool features. So, for example, it has the, it enables the usage of all the Stream Deck devices on Linux without needing to code anything. And it supports the uh, like the, the mini version, the extra, the extra large version, and the regular version. Uh, it also supports enabling and connecting multiple Stream Deck devices on one computer. So it has a multi-device function. It has brightness control, supports the controlling of the brightness from both the configuration UI and the buttons on the device itself, such as the brightness of the LCD screens in the buttons. Uh, so in case you don't want it to be super bright, that kind of thing. They also made it possible that you can configure uh, the button display so you can have icons and text or just icons and, or in text only. Uh, it makes it really configurable. The multi-action support is available where you can run commands, write text, press hotkey combinations like I said earlier all from one single button. And the button pages supports multiple pages of buttons and dynamically setting up buttons to switch between those pages. That is really cool. So depending on what you're doing, you can have it automatically switch to those different pages. And you can see at the top of the, on the video version, you can see that there's up to 10 pages that you can switch to. So you have a set of 15 keys on the default so you have three rows of five buttons on each thing. That's the the official. That's not the, the mini has I think six buttons, and then there's the fifteen buttons, and then I think there's like a thirty two extra large version. But the fifteen with those ten pages, you now essentially have a hundred and fifty buttons that you could click. That's really really cool. So if you want to check that out, you know, I hope I, I I hope this is a, a highly maintained thing because it is kind of expensive to get a Stream Deck. Because a Stream Deck regular version is like $140, $130, something like that. Um, I could be wrong on exact, like the exact amount, but it's somewhere around the, that line. And um, But with this, making it makes it possible to use it on Linux. I'm very, very tempted. Um, if I didn't already have this, I'd definitely get it. But, okay, I'm going to try to convince myself I don't need it. I don't need it. I want it, but I don't. Okay, just continue with the show, Michael. Okay, let's do that. It also has the ability to auto reconnect. So if it if it disconnects, it'll automatically gracefully reconnect in case the device is plugged, uh, unplugged, and replugged in that kind of thing. And it has support for saving and restoring Steam, uh, Stream Deck configurations. So this is really cool, and I wish I could justify buying it. But if you don't have uh, something already, and you're interested in doing some kind of Stream Deck stuff, this could be really cool to check out. So yeah, the Stream Deck. Uh, underscore UI project from GitHub, on GitHub is available with a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some great news for more application news, and that is Caliber 4.0 has been released. It's been two the, in their in their blog post. It says it's been two years since Caliber 3.0, and then they list all the stuff that's different. Now this is true that Caliber 3.0 was two years ago. But the way they wrote it kind of makes it seem like, you know, I've seen people saying that it's it's great that it's back finally. But Caliber is actually an active development. And it's, it, even though it sounds like it isn't because the way they said it, they're referring to how long it's been between the major releases. So 3 to 4 or 3.x to 4.x. But there were actually 48 releases of the 3.x series in that two-year period. So it's very much a very active developed project. So anyway... In this release, they're saying that they're making the, Cali the Caliber content server even more capable as well as migrating Caliber itself from Qt WebKit to Qt Web Engine because the former, the Qt WebKit, is no longer maintained, which is true. Uh, the content server it has gained the ability to edit metadata, add, remove books, and even convert books to and from all the formats that Caliber itself supports. This is very, very cool. And it's now a full-fledged interface to your Caliber libraries. They've actually done a complete rewrite of various parts of Caliber, such as the ebook viewer, PDF output, book details, and many more. So every attempt, they also say that every attempt has been made to preserve features and functionality in a backwards compatible way so that you 
will pretty much be able to just tra- transition to all the 4.0 uh, series really quickly. And they also actually already released another version. So 4.0 was released, I think, a week ago, like this week. And then like three days later, 4.1 was released. And this shows the position that like, gives you a, a bunch of different new features and some bug fixes and stuff. One of those features is making it possible to show the position in the book, like the, your your position in the book, in the footer and header of the system of, of the application. Similar to how they could do it in uh, Caliber three is now in Caliber four, but also it's not even like because in the Caliber three it was just in the top left of it of the viewer. Now it's available in the footer and the header. So that's pretty cool. And if you like, to, if you are into not aware of what Caliber is, it's essentially it's an ebook reader and an ebook library uh, organizational tool. So if you you know read a lot of ebooks or want a nice way to organize your ebooks or have like PDF organization and that kind of thing, Caliber is a great option for that. And I'm really happy to see that they're upgrading the the core fun- functionality of it because it has because you know it's been a couple years for the main stuff to be updated, but they have been doing a lot of cool work over those years. Uh, so I think Caliber is a pretty cool application. And if you are interested in seeing, you know, checking out an ebook reader, it's probably the best on the platform on Linux. It might be, it might be the best open source uh, ebook reader in general, but uh, yeah. So if you're interested in checking it out, I have a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is Flatpak 1.5 has been released and there's a lot of new features in this release. If you're not aware, Flatpaks is a universal package system for applications to be able to run on your Linux desktop, regardless of what distro you're using, which is a very important piece. I should probably make a video about why this is important, but there's multiple different formats that are, there's three formats right now, the Flatpak, Snaps, and App Images that are making it possible to have universal packaging on Linux, which is very important. I will make a video about why later. So, first of all, in this particular release for Flatpaks, they've added a new command, uh, Flatpak, Flatpak Mask, allows pinning versions and avoiding auto-downloads, which is pretty cool. So if you want to keep a particular version for some reason, I don't know why, but maybe you do, maybe you have some issues prior, prior or like when you upgraded it was an issue, you can say, I just want to keep this version, and then the auto-updates will stop until you allow it to go back. Then there's also ability to support self updates and update monitoring in the Flatpak portal. They've also fixed some uh, some updates um, of exported services with a uh, dbus dash broken. They've also done a lot of interesting things for the uh, new key, config key default languages that allows additions to the system list instead of overwriting it. And they've also done support for images tagged with labels as well as annotations. They all, all allow for generating a history for the for the uh, the the images of the particular you know like they support Docker for example they support Docker mime types in addition to the OCI mime types now and also there's a lot of new uh, a lot of other features that are not really that like huge features that are just improvements overall polishing as well as some bug bug fixes and performance improvements and that kind of thing so. If you're interested in checking out all of the list of what's, I'll have a link to their GitHub, uh, or I think, is it GitHub or GitLab? I don't remember. Maybe it's GitLab. Whatever. I'll have a link to the latest release of Flatpak 1.5 in the show notes below. Speaking of Flatpaks and universal formats, there's actually a universal desktop app store that's been announced, and this is called the App Outlet. Now, we actually talked about a website that was kind of the same thing, the universal app store I don't remember exactly the website URL, but we talked about it in a previous episode, and the reason why I didn't bother to look up what the URL was is because it doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, for some reason you could still get the source code for the website if you wanted to relaunch it, I guess, but it lasted only a couple months or so, so I'm not really sure how much effort was put into it. However, it did inspire the developer of the app outlet to create a desktop version of that, or that concept anyway. It's, they, they didn't really take the code, but they were inspired by it to create the App Outlet. So the App Outlet is a universal application store, and it, it allows you to easily search and download applications that run on most Linux distributions through App Images, Flatpaks, and Snaps. So it's really interesting. I have tried it out. I have tried the App Image version and the Snap version. There's not a Flatpak version yet, but they said that they are working on one. And it's interesting because 
you know, there's some there's some issues with these the app outlet. And I really like the fact that they are doing it and they're making this because it's a very interesting concept and they are doing it in a a you know a, a universal way in itself. So like the store itself is universal because of the different formats they're going to be supporting because they already support snaps and app images. Uh, and I've actually tried both, but like I said, and I'm currently running the snap right now and I've tried in another system I had app images on it. And it has a lot of cool features. It has a good filtering system in the sense that it has the ability to search for different applications that you want, but the categorization of the browsing is not that good. So, for example, I searched for a couple uh, applications, and for example, for specifically, I searched for a text editor that I prefer. And when I searched for it, I saw what categories it was in, and I was able to find the flat pack and the snap for that particular applica- application. And when I searched for it, I could get it. But when I went to the categories that it was put in, for example, it was a text editor, so it was in the development uh, section. It was also in the text editor section and the development section and some other stuff. But I went to the, te- the text editor category, and it was there. But I went to the development category that it was also associated to, and it wasn't there. So it's it's hit or miss in whether it, like the organization still needs some work. Uh, they have some a little bit of some redundancy in their, in their categorization stuff and the organizational structure. And how you filter things, and there's actually right now the only the ability to install directly from the app outlet is through Flatpak. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that the fact that uh, it doesn't come as an app uh, as a Flatpak, it only comes as a Snap and App Images, but it doesn't have the ability to install either one of those. Uh, so what happens right now if you go to the Snap section on the on the uh, app app outlet, or you ha- find an application that has a Snap version, it will uh, send you a link to the Snap Store that you can get the you know install command there. It doesn't have direct install support yet. They are working on that as well as somehow they're going to do try to do the same thing with app images. I guess they're going to make it where you can just download the app image and put it somewhere. Hopefully they'll just make it like a in your home folder. They'll just do an apps folder in your home folder. I think that makes the most sense for app images. Um, but that's actually that's what I do for my setup. But uh, it's it's a really interesting thing, and I I do wish them a lot of luck because I do think that this has a lot of potential, and I want it to be made, and I want it to be good. But right now, it's still pretty early days, so they still need a, a little bit of work. And I but I do like how they're doing like popular apps. Uh, you know, they're doing like for, um, featuring different sections and stuff, and they are making it nice to be able to search for an application and see. Which whether you it's a snap or a flat pack or an app images uh, like which one you want, you can just choose from the search results. That's cool. Uh, but the only issue I've found so far really is that when you browse, it pretty much just shows flat packs and then nothing else. Like it'll occasionally show something else. But if you search for a particular application, it will show you all of the different options. But if you browse, it typically is just showing flat packs. So overall, it's a really cool concept, and I'm not trying to bash it in the sense that it's you know telling you that don't use it. If you want to use it, feel free to do so. I think that it has a lot of potential, and I want it to be good. So if you want to use it and then give like feedback and that kind of thing, that would be really great. I think they would definitely appreciate that. So I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying keep in mind that it is definitely in the early stages. So don't expect it to be you know to have everything and work perfectly. So anyway. I'm happy to see that this thing exists. It, it has a lot of potential. It looks really good. And uh, I can't wait to see the future versions and how it works out. So if you want to check out the app outlet, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is a new lossless image compressor for Linux called M Compressor. I-M Compressor. I'll have a link, of course, in the show notes below if you're interested in checking it out. But the M Compressor allows you to take... A, an image that's most specifically right now for JPEG and PNG files, where you can take them and then compress this, compress that image without losing the quality of the image. So it lowers the file size. For example, if you wanted to make your images smaller for web web development, or you make it easier to send to people through email or something like that, and you have like big files and you want to you know make a smaller version, you can do that with M Compressor. Now it's not necessarily meant for like power users in the sense like it's not a there, there are command line scriptable options for tools like that that allows you to do like batch processing of tons of images and really quickly and automatically and that kind of thing and that's not really what m compressor is for 
M compressor is for people who want simplicity and ease of use of doing this task because maybe you don't do it often, but you still need to have it as an op an option for you when you do. You know, let's say if you're if you you know write blogs or something and you want to have like a couple images here and there, but you don't want to have like you don't have to do hundreds of images all at once. This is a great option for those types of use cases. So M compressor, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below if you're interested. Up next in the show and the last topic for this episode is Microsoft has announced a dual screen foldable Android phone called the Surface Duo. And this is actually a pretty interesting device. Now I wanted to talk to you about it because I wanted to bring it up and we got to have a conversation about the concept of a foldable phone and whether people are interested in about it. I'll have a link in the show notes for a discourse thread, a discourse forum thread for the discourse.destinationlinux.network forum that we're going to talk about. I'll have a link in that about this particular topic because I think that foldable phones are interesting, but also kind of pointless. Uh, but maybe I could be wrong. Some people might like the idea of having like a tablet that you could fold and, you know, etc. But it seems kind of, it seems kind of pointless to me. However, I'm open to your ideas and to what your opinions are. So please uh, follow the link in the show notes uh, about, you know, to go to the forum and, or if you just want to comment in the YouTube comments below, you can do that as well. Or on BitChute if you use BitChute too. But anyway, so the interesting thing about this is that it has two 5.6 inch uh, touchscreens. So when it actually like folds out, it's actually like an 8.3 inch display, kind of like a small tablet. And, they also have this interesting 360 degree hinge in the middle. Now, if you look at the way that the Samsung works is that it, it's a small device that when you fold it, there's a screen, a smaller screen on one side of the folded phone. And then when you open it, it's a full screen that isn't separated. It's not two displays like this. It's one full display. However, it doesn't go beyond that folding. So you only have that you know the smaller display on the other side or that big display and the way that uh, the Huawei phone does is it has the a big display that folds and then it but it folds in the reverse like the way that the Samsung device and this Microsoft device they fold where the non screen is folded in like the screens are folded into each other and then you have the back of the the device is like a case or like the regular plastic case or metal case or whatever they use to make it um, but the Huawei folds the opposite way, so like there's, it's a screen on on both sides. So it's an interesting situation because one of the reasons I think that the foldable phone is not that ideal is because they don't really work on making the phones durable. So you have to have a case essentially because these phones are like they meant to, they're meant to look really pretty, but they're not meant to be you know durable in any way whatsoever. So with the case of the Samsung phone and the phone for the Microsoft phone, they have potential to be able to have a case on them while still utilizing the fold. Whereas the Huawei phone doesn't really because it folds in a reverse style. So it has like, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, but it, it folds in a reverse style so that the, the screen, when it's folded, is essentially it's not possible to put a case on that one like i guess there could be if you just wrap the case around it but you'd have to have essentially two different cases on both displays or both sides of the display and it'd be kind of weird and a similar thing for the samsung you'd have to actually have a place where it isn't full case thing it's just more like it's in this crease it'll fold oh, there gonna be i guess two separate cases you put on these things and it just seems like if these phones were more durable i would it would make more sense for them to exist but I think the way that uh, Microsoft actually is designing theirs to be two different displays kind of makes more sense because it makes it possible to have a case on them without being excessive. Because the hinge is interesting, although the hint, the case might be too bulky for the hinge to completely lay down. I don't know about that. Anyway, see, the that's why I have a problem with these foldable phones. They're not durable because no smartphone these days are durable. And um, it's just, and it's just a weird design to me. I don't know. I don't really see the purpose of them when you could have a laptop or a tablet and accomplish the same thing. I get the whole not 
carrying as many devices around, but it's still a pretty bulky device. So I don't know. Let me know what you think in the forums or in the comments below, and uh, we can talk about it further. Uh, but if you are interested in getting this phone, you'd have to wait for a very long time because this uh, Microsoft phone won't be, won't be out until Christmas of 2020. So, you know, significant wait period. But I still wanted to talk about it because I want to talk about the idea of the foldable phone in general and because they did announce it. And it is running Android, which is technically Linux. So it is somewhat related to the show. <laughs> Say ha. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to talk about it, I'll have a link in the forums uh, for the forum thread in the show notes below. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. We also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Private Internet Access, Amazon, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. as also a part of the Destination Linux network, so check out destinationlinux.network to find out more content from there. And just a reminder, this show is live usually every Saturday. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.